Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Good night. Depending on where you are in this lovely world uh, and whatever time zone, thanks so much for joining us here live on Serverless Office Hours. Uh, welcome if you're joining us via the AWS Twitch channel, if you're joining us on YouTube via the Serverless Land channel, or you're joining us via LinkedIn Live. We are super happy uh, to have you. Uh, my name is Julian Wood. I'm a developer advocate for AWS at Serverless, and I'm super happy to have one of our gurus going to be talking today, um, Mehmet Nuridovici. Welcome to Serverless Office Hours. I think you have been on before, haven't you? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. I so we, we did two sessions with, uh, I think, Eric earlier. Yeah. Eric is awesome. So yeah, now now you get to do the real deal. We won't tell that to Eric. He'll be mortally offended. So you're a software development engineer. So you're actually building all the kind of stuff. And you work within AWS in sort of the AWS Infrastructure's code team. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind just letting us, what is the AWS Infrastructure's code team? And then how what is your sort of journey to come and work in a cool sounding team name? Yeah, sure. So my name is Mehmet Nuridevici. I'm a SD in the infrastructure as a as code team. So uh, my team is mainly working on the AWS SAM CLI. So it's um, you know a command line utility for developers to build, uh, test, deploy their service applications. And in in our organization, we also have the SAM team, which manages the the template part, the you know cloud formation macro uh, service transform. And we also have the App Composer team. So we are focusing on the developer productivity uh, on the service applications. Ah, excellent. Well, it is nice to know how, even though these are different services and products within AWS, how ha having it within a, a you know a, an AWS infrastructure's code team shows how it's all sort of uh, coming together, and you know all these things are worked on together, which is uh, which is super cool. Uh, we are live, as I have mentioned, so please let us know where you're from and where you're joining from, and uh, and anything. I see we have some super keen people. I think there's someone in my team called Benjamin Smith who says good morning. Well, good morning to you, Ben. And I know uh, Ben's on the other side of the world with someone else in our team, Dave. Boyne, who also says hello world. So it's nice to see that I, my, my teammates are cert certainly watching. And uh, Wahid, uh, thanks for joining us via LinkedIn. Uh, so nice to see you all. Well, before we quickly get on to uh, Mehmet's awesome guru stuff, let's just look back over what's been happening in AWS land over the past week. Last week, while all the Americans, and Mehmet is based in Vancouver, and I'm based in London, so we weren't part of this. But Americans were celebrating 4th of July, but the super keen of you were all interested in Lambda cold starts. And so we had uh, Maxim David from Datadog, who uh, wrote a benchmarking tool, which looks at literally every Lambda runtime, including all the custom ones, and shows you uh, uh, everything there is uh, about profiling the, the cold starts. And he had some really good tips and tricks and information on improving cold starts, so really useful to watch if you were having too much barbecue or you were letting off too many fireworks and service office hours maybe wasn't your priority for the day, which I don't understand. But you know, we'll 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 give you that for one chance. So that all the, um, that and all the other uh, previous episodes on our Serverless Land YouTube channel. Then, in terms of what's new for AWS, well, uh, DynamoDB seems to be doing things interestingly over the over the past week. Um, uh, a distributed cache provider. So if you're using AWS.NET, uh, you can use DynamoDB as a distributed cache, uh, as part of a distributed cache uh, component, which is part of, of .NET. And also interestingly, uh, DynamoDB local version two has come out. So if you are doing some local testing, and um, obviously we do like to test things in the cloud, which is possibly helpful. We're gonna be certainly covering a lot of that today. Uh, but yeah, DynamoDB local has been upgraded to version two. And uh, yes, just has a lot more features and functionality. So that you can have a look at the link, which will take you to what's new posts. Uh, just some other compute blog posts, which often cover a lot of releases and other kind of things. Top up on the list, uh, our good friend, uh, Ben Smith, who was uh, saying good morning earlier. Oh, my mouse is gone. I can't click on the thing. That Ben Smith, uh, he's wrote, written a really good, in case you missed it, for Q2 2023. This is literally everything in serverless that has come out in Q2 2023. And I think you'll be amazed and impressed about how many things have been going on. So yeah, lots of information as a sort of catch-all blog post. Uh, something that was released yesterday, which Powan, Anil, and Sri wrote about, is detecting and stopping recursive loops in Lambda functions. So if you're using SNS or SQS, uh, really useful to be able to, uh, Lambda will basically automatically stop those recursive loops after 16 iterations. And that's certainly going to save you some money and save, uh, and save you some head scratching when you're trying to work out what's going on. And uh, yeah, uh, Lambda throttling limits. Uh, Ashan is one of our principal engineers on Lambda. So really deep in the Lambda stack talking about that. And also, yeah, we all seem to be talking about Lambda at the moment. But uh, uh, an interesting post from Jeff Chen and Jeff Lee all about uh, error handling patterns, talking about DLQs and talking about um, uh, Lambda destinations as well. Um, <clears throat> 
Don't forget, October the 26th is EDA Day, Event Driven Architectures Day. It's happening in Nashville. This is the 2023 version. There was a day in London last year, which is wildly successful. So I really suggest you to get your tickets in before they do sell out. Um, a whole bunch of speakers really diving deep into this whole Event Driven Architectures, which is going to be super useful. So put that in your diary, October the 26th in Nashville. Also, the serverless land page, which serverless land is all things to do with serverless on AWS. There's a new learning page which has been uh, put together, and a whole bunch of different resource types from learning guides for uh, you know replatforming, for doing Java, for uh, on Lambda, for custom optimization for serverless plus a whole bunch of workshops. Workshops are finding one of the best ways to learn about serverless. You get hands-on, build some cool applications, build some cool integrations. And these are now all categorized uh, with their various different services and categories. So really easy to find. So yeah, really good, helpful new learning page on um, uh, on service land. Also, a slight little bit of self-promotion, but I've put together a Lambda Fundamentals Guide, 23 videos literally starting from the very beginning of Lambda, of what is serverless, all the way through different ways to invoke it, uh, observability, uh, the execution environment, lifecycle, and a whole lot more. So if you are interested in getting started with Lambda or you have people who are scratching their heads about where to go, uh, I can suggest this as a useful thing. But on the theory of Lambda, and we touched on it yes, uh, earlier, um, Mehmet is going to be talking about Lambda testing and remote invokes. So Mehmet, over to you. We know we can invoke Lambda functions remotely. How does this now work with testing? Uh, sure. Um, let me share my screen to start. Yes, certainly. Yeah. And remember, we are live, so send us your questions, your comments. We have also got Sashin, Sashin Gupta, who's joined us. Hello, Sashin. So yeah, please uh, let us know where you're from, and uh, any questions for Mehmet and myself, we'd be happy to uh, to chat to you. All right. Uh, let me start uh, first where you know this idea came from. So. Um, when we look at um, you know local development, if you have a serverless function on your uh, you know local machine, when you make a code change for your development iteration, you first run some build uh, to build your code, and then you run some local invoke to test your code that you know uh, to see that you know it works as expected. Uh, so this is kind of your development loop when you're making like you know changes. So this is your development iteration. Every time you make a change, you go through this loop. So um, a couple of years ago, we introduced SamSync um, under the Sam Accelerate project. Uh, so the goal is that you know move that development uh, from your local machine to your cloud stack testing stack. Um, of course, we you know uh, say this a couple of times. The local development is limited in some places, like the emulation and also some of the permissions that cannot be emulated like hundred percent. If you want to have you know one to one uh, testing of your service app application, we definitely you know uh, prefer testing in the cloud. So with the Samsung, uh, you make a code change. We uh, listen it in the background. You can run it with the watch uh, flag. We will listen to your files and folders in the background. As soon as you make a change, we build your function and then synchronize your changes uh, with your application in the cloud. And once you made the synchronization, so the next step is actually testing your code. Uh, before the remote invoke, you either need to switch to your browser and then go to AWS console on the Lambda console and invoke your function manually there, um, which is not you know the best UX because you have to switch uh, from your terminal, from your editor, back to your you know browser to test there. Or you can also use AWS CLI, that, that works. Uh, but with the AWS CLI, you have to provide a physical ID and the output is printed, uh, printed into a file, then you have to read that file. So it's not, again, one-to-one -one, you know, experience if I compare with the SAM local. So what we want to do with the SAM remote work is that when you make the change with the SAM sync, uh, we, uh, we want to give an ability, just like SAM local invoke, for our developers to use SAM remote invoke to invoke their functions in the cloud and see you know, their changes works as expected. So is this all about sort of just avoiding that context switch of you're in your developing environment, you are building with SAM. Uh, in fact, I know you're going to touch on this later, but this doesn't work only with SAM. So if you're already thinking, oh, I don't use SAM, I use the CDK or CloudFormation or Terraform or Pulumi or whatever, 
uh, Sam local, um, Sam remote invoke can still work for you. So hold your horses. Don't uh, don't don't think it's only a Sam thing. But <clears throat> so this is a sort of to avoid that context change. You're building your application you're using some sort of build process. You then upload to that cloud. Maybe it's going to be a, a Sam sync, or maybe it's going to be uh, you know even zipping up your function or any kind of thing, getting it into the cloud, or using Sam's actual deploy. And then you can just use you know Sam remote invoke directly from the environment, not having to think about what that AWS CLI command is, or yeah, jump to the console. So is that the sort of use case? Uh, and just make that whole invoking a little bit simpler. Yeah, exactly. So it will work, but with the some applications, just like other comments, like you don't need to know your physical ID. You can just provide us the logic ah, yeah. and then we will resolve it. But if you already have your physical ID and if you're you know a CDK or Terraform customer, then we will, you know, we can still invoke your function. And uh, we're gonna show it a little bit uh, now. Um, so I have uh, three example applications today. The first one is um, really simple uh, service application with just one function in it. And if I open my function code, it's basically gets an event, uh, extracts the message and person keywords from uh, from the JSON input, and then prints it. Uh, if nothing is provided, of course, it will print the hello world message there. So I can switch to my terminal. And uh, you know I can just run Samsung dashboard at the top to start my uh, you know Samsung session, and at the bottom I can start you know invoking my function. This stack is already deployed, so it's ready to you know test. So I can just run stack remote. So so just because I know some of the text, uh, Mehmet wants to have a slightly bigger screen because it's obviously easy to see at the bottom. But at the top, um, Mehmet was just running the Sam uh, Samsung, which basically. Um, uh, does does a sort of quick deploy into the cloud, and uh, so your function is then running in the cloud and really easy. As soon as you save, you save your local file. It's going to do an immediate quick build if it needs to, and then sync that up into the into the cloud. So that, that's what Moment was just running on the top. Ah, yeah. Okay, correct. Uh, thanks for reminding that, Julian. So I'm running the Samsung watch command at the top. So at the bottom, I can show you how the Sam remote demo works. So um, my application is deployed, so I can just run Sam remote demo. And then press enter. This will find my function, invoke it, and then print the result back to me. Hello. So if you if so if you've got a single function, you don't even need to provide the logical ID. It's just going to assume well. There's one function. That's all you need to invoke. Exactly. So even simpler. Uh, yeah, and uh, we also have this uh, some config toml file, uh, which gives the the defaults. So like if you have you know certain defaults that you want to use all the time, you can just give it here. Uh, so let me comment this out here. Uh, as you can see at the top, I have my stack name already defined. So since it's already defined, I don't need to provide the stack oh, name. Yeah. I can just run Sam. Remote. Yeah, actually, I think that's what, in terms of Sam, I think that's one of the underused things I see is using that Sam config toml file. Uh, yeah, lots of, I know, let me, I'll try and dig it up. But uh, Eric's, in fact, done, Eric Johnson has, in fact, done a, a whole bunch of posts and some videos on that of, the, of quite a few things you can still stick in your Sam config uh, toml file. And I know that's quite useful when people are building multiple applications, even multiple services. They literally copy and paste that uh, Sam uh, config toml file. And, you know, if you're going to do cache builds, you're going to do parallel builds, uh, you know, some of the uh, Sam CRCD kind of things, super useful to just put the, the, put this in your in your config file and yeah, just saves that extra steps of having to put a stack name, for example. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and like stack name is one of the parameters that's been used in a couple of comments. So I can just put it in the global here, then I don't need to provide in anywhere else. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, this was the, you know, the simplest one. I have the stack name and I have just one function. I can just invoke it with the remote invoke. Uh, what if I have you know more than one function? I can just do some remote invoke and then give my uh, you know function name. Um, that will be logical ID because now I have my stack name. Uh, if I invoke this, what we will do in the background is that we will find the physical ID of this uh, uh, logical ID that's been provided uh, inside the stack that that's also defined here. So now this finds uh, you know my function, invokes it, and then returns the result back to me. If I don't have this, you know, defined as a default here, I can just comment this out and come back to here. Play my terminal. I can just do Sam remote invoke dash dash stack name Sam app, and then provide my uh, function name. This will work the same. Invoke my function and return the result back to me. So uh, you you mentioned in the beginning that this is not just you know works with the Sam Sam applications. Um, 
But if you have, uh, let's say, a Terraform application and you need to use a physical ID. So let me show you how to work with the physical ID example. So I will use our SAM list resources command. This will list all the resources that, it, that I have in my stack. Let me write one more time. My terminal size was a little bit. Um, oh, sorry. Since I commented out stack name, I need to call it stack name here. <laughs> you see why I kind of see the physical ID? Okay, so here's my physical ID. I can just grab this physical ID here in my terminal. And the stack name is commented out in the global, uh, in the defaults. So I can just do SAM remote uh, invoke and then give my physical ID. And this will work. Uh, just like so you know, the, the stack name doesn't have to be a SAM stack. Well, I mean, it's just normal CloudFormation. So anything that supports CloudFormation, it can read that. Well, it's going to go to the CloudFormation and see see the stack resources. Correct. Uh, even for the SAM list resources, like uh, it can yeah. be a CloudFormation yeah, attempted uh, application as well. All right. Uh, so this was the different ways to invoke it, um, and. And uh, let me let me open this one back here so that we don't need to provide stack name for the rest of the comments. So this was my function. Um, if nothing is provided, this will print hello world. Uh, I can also send some you know event with my send remote invoke. So I can just uh, say message hi. And if I invoke with this, then instead of hello world, um, my message is saying hi, it will print hi world. So um, I can also send different payloads to my function. If, if nothing is provided, uh, an empty payload will be sent to your function. Um, you can also use a, a file. So I have my uh, an event JSON file in my application, uh, which has the message and you know person properties that's used in my uh, service function. So I can just do send remote invoke dash dash event file and then provide that uh, file name. So instead of reading from the you know command line options, now it will read the uh, the the, uh, the request payload from that file. Uh, once I invoke it, so it will print you know hi John here. Um, if you want to use so event file can also use by with the standard input. So if you if you want to read from a file or maybe you know another stream, you can read that and pipe it into the send remote invoke, and we will uh, send it uh, as a request payload. So what I can do is that I can do cat events event.json and then pipe it to send remote invoke. Uh, for this time, uh, for the event file option, I need to provide dash. This is pretty similar to send local invoke. It also has the same uh, option. If you provide a dash in the send local invoke. You can pipe to you know you can pipe other files or you know streams into a standard input, and then we will read it and send as a request payload. And the uh, the message is sent here. But then Sam can also generate those uh, event files with a Sam generate event because if you you know pretend you're doing something from uh, uh, API Gateway or an S3 notification event or even a Kafka notification event. You know, you'd be able to uh, simulate that as an in, as an input payload. Yeah, exactly. So we have the some local uh, generate event, I believe. Yeah. So uh, if you if your function is listening to another event, you can just you know generate an event template from one of these examples, and you can use that as an input uh, when you are invoking your function in the cloud. Yeah. It's interesting. This just seems so seamless because I've used this a lot for the SAM local invoke because, my, I mean, my my sort of thinking on the local testing is often I've got a little bit of functionality of code. Um, I haven't quite got to the stage of the unit test yet, but I still want to just try and test things out. So sometimes I even take Lambda completely out of the uh, out of the loop, so to, so to speak, because it's just Node or Python. If I've got Node or Python running on my local machine, I can just you know save the file and run that Node as it, with a local hand or with a local um, harness, just to say run my function. What's going to be the input and output? Excellent, that's now working. Uh, and then what I can do is I can do you know if I want to do things locally, well that's also really easy. I can just do the SAM local, you know, build the function, do the SAM local invoke, uh, pass the input file, and off you go. But that next sort of step of, okay, it's great to do it in the cloud. And the reason I want to do it in the cloud is 
often two folds from my perspective is one from iron permissions. I want to check that iron permissions are working. You know, that obviously is not going to work, work locally. And then also if my if my function is then going to access other kind of cloud resources that are already in the cloud, well, it's going to make sense to run that, uh, run that in the cloud. So the distinction between running things locally and running things in the cloud uh, is just instead of SAM local invoke, I'm just running SAM remote invoke. And you can see how quick it is. I'm not really waiting for that. Uh, you know, any sort of uh, long latency or everything, and it's just the same as what I'm doing locally. I'm, I like it. I like it. Yeah. And uh, just on that part, so I'm already running this SAM sync at the top. Uh, so I can just change, you know, the output of uh, from my function. So, like, I can just change the message here. Uh, so serverless office hours. As soon as I hit the save button, you can see here. It picks up the change and then synchronizes my function. And once this is done, I'll just get it ready here. So this is uh, completed. I can run some remote invoke, and I'll get my new message here. here. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, even my comment wasn't even taking the the, the Sam sync into consideration because I mean that is really really quick. And in fact, um, yeah, we do have a question who came in from Sid SSN sixteen. So yeah, how do we think about Sam sync? So Sam sync in this case, an alternative to, to, to us just deploying via Terraform. Um, yeah, I know, I know what I would think about that, but what, what would you say, Mehmet? Um, so I guess that, uh, you know, deploying via Terraform, it's still like a, you know, production grade deployment. And that's the same with the SAM deploy. So if you're deploying to your, you know, uh, testing environment, uh, not the development testing environment or production environment, we definitely uh, recommend using SAM deploy because that goes through CFN and that does all the validations and CFN makes sure everything is deployed as expected. Samsung, on the other hand, is more of a like cloud development tool. So you're a developer, you have your development stack in your, uh, you know, in your account, and you want to do quick changes and see how it works. Uh, that is where Samsung comes from. Uh, you can use Samsung to make those changes really quickly, test them, and then you know you can go to next step, which is the deployment. Yeah. So uh, and underneath the hood, it means. Basically, it's faster because it's not doing a full CloudFormation deploy. It's actually talking directly to the Lambda API. And in fact, not just Lambda, Samsung is also going to work with API Gateway and also going to work with Step Functions. So it's actually using the service APIs to literally just quickly push the code up into the service API. So it's not doing all that robustness of a, of a CloudFormation deploy and checking for the drift and doing all that kind of thing. Hence, it's, uh, hence that's really quick. But then I hope you understand that caveat. Well, that means it's not doing all the checks and balances that Mehmet was mentioning that CloudFormation does, which you'd want to do in a production deployment. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, next up, um, this is how we default print your function execution. Uh, you can see the logs. You can see your payload. What if we just want to have you know output in more programmatical way? Let's say you want to pipe this result to okay. another tool that you have. So you can use the output option here. So if I run some remote screen mode involved, dash dash output JSON, I will pipe it to JQ so that we can have nice uh, formatting here. Uh, so if I use the uh, output JSON, now what we are doing in the background is that we get the full response um, as the dictionary and return it into a JSON and then uh, return it back to the terminal. So you can now use this output and grab the information that you need and then pipe it to another tool that you might have. Uh, for instance, you know, one of the examples that I can show here is that we should have the, uh, where is it? So we should have the trace ID here. So I can use this trace ID to get, you know, the tracing information from this execution. So we also have the same traces command to display that. So I can just run some traces dash dash trace ID. And uh, in order to grab the trace ID, I will run some remote invoke here uh, with the output JSON, and I will pipe it to JQ. Uh, just to, you know, this is really simple JQ um, uh, options. Dash R means raw output, which means it's going to remove the double quotes beginning and the end, since this is a string. And I'm, I want JQ to extract this information, which is, you know, go to response metadata, HTTP headers, and X Amazon trace ID. Uh, which is the uh, you know keys here, and then just basically do a substring start from the fifth element to fourteenth element, and I need to slip a little bit here. Let me slip five because trace is not available right away. There's a little bit of time that I need to wait, so you can just invoke 
uh, wait for five seconds, and once the uh, everything is done, we should see the trace IDs here. Still partial. Uh, I can just try one more time. So I'm traces dash dash trace ID. Then use it here. And you can see the full trace ID. Yeah, of course, yeah. the simple function. If you have more complex tracing information, that should be printed here. Um, but yeah, this was just an example to show with the traces. If you have other tools and you want to grab, you know, any of the information here, you can just use the output JSON option to uh, grab those informations easily. And uh, just one thing I did spot there when where you were looking at the traces that actually, um, oh, now it's gone out of my brain. I was, I was thinking it, uh, that recursion detection, the, oh, there's a value it puts in the, in the, in the trace ID, which is what it uses to check the recursion detection. I spotted the, uh, that over there, that value, the value will come to me. I'll think, I'll think of it. But anyway, I got sidetracked with what you were showing, but uh, I, it was just exciting to see the release that came out recently. And because that's basically how uh, the recursion detection works. It actually adds a lineage. There we go, a lineage ID. So it puts a lineage ID in in the trace header, in the trace information, which it would can see. So sorry to sidetrack, but. Um, I just happened to spot that, which is cool. But uh, Sid SSN 16 has come back and said, so just to confirm, I can SAM remote invoke any Lambda function that could be managed in any ISE to test my Lambda. Exactly, that's true. Um, if you have SAM or cloud formation application, you can just use the logical ID that you have. <laughs> so uh, logical ID is you know something you define in your template, right? If I open my template here, this is my logical ID. But once this is deployed, this is transformed to physical ID, which usually has some, you know, other characters in the beginning or in the end. So if you deploy through, uh, let's say, Terraform and you have those IDs there, you can grab, you know, physical ID of your function and then use SAM remote in there. Okay, yeah. And you can use SAM to then get those physical IDs, which is just a little bit simpler than the, the CloudFormation list resources. Um, but actually, one bit of uh, nuance, actually, while I'm thinking about it, uh, said SSN, uh, you can remote invoke any Lambda that could be managed by any IIC. In fact, it's any Lambda function. So even if you created a Lambda function in the console, you are just actually using the Lambda API to uh, to invoke it. So yeah, it's not even linked to anything as infrastructure of code. If you've built a Lambda function in any way, shape, or form, you can invoke it um, with some remote invoke. Yeah, exactly. As soon as you have physical ID or Aaron, uh, we will invoke yeah. it for you. All right. Um, so the next part that I want to show is that um, so we show how to send the request payload. But if you ever check the uh, the Lambda API, the Invoke API, you know that there are other parameters. Maybe I can show from the AWS CLI here. So if I just do AWS Lambda Invoke uh, help, um, there should be other options here. So like you can say the log type. Uh, oh, yeah. I think you can just set the log type as none or tail. By default, we are using tail because this is how you see the logs. If you don't want, you can just set this to none, and then no logs will be returned. There's also invocation type. So you can use uh, the dry run invocation or the event invocation. Uh, so the dry run just validates your param parameters and verify uh, that your user has the permission to invoke that function. Event is basically asynchronous execution. It will execute your function, just return the request ID, and that's it. You won't see the result. You won't see the logs. And by default, we are using request response here. So you can provide all these options uh, with the SAM remote invoke as well. So what I can do, SAM remote invoke dash dash parameter. And uh, let's first show the uh, the log type. Log type equals none. Now, as you can see, none of the logs have been printed here because that's been extracted. I can also show with the output JSON option here. And you can see in the previous example, we had the, the log information encoded with base 64 in one of the keys here. But since I said log type is none, then none of them is returned. I only have the payload and some other information here. Um, I can also show how this works with the, uh, the invocation type. So I can just give the invocation type parameter here, event. Uh, let me type to JQ so that will be easier. So if I invoke with the event here, um, I'm going to get the request ID. I have my uh, trace ID here. So I can just use this trace ID to see how the execution is moving forward. Or I can also grab this request ID to you know, query the logs from my function if I, if I need to. 
But as you can see, there is no payload return because it is asynchronous execution and stats code is to, uh, 200x, which means it's successfully executed. Uh, to show the difference between the, the dry run, if I run this with the dry run option, it is it will be pretty much the same, but now I don't have trace ID because my function is not actually executed. It's just test, you know, I have permissions, the parameters are good, and it returns, it still returns 200, uh, which means um, it is successful. But again, I don't have any payload, and I also don't have trace ID or other information here. Yeah, I've actually, I've never really explored the dry run, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see it over here. But uh, so, I mean, that's still using the Lambda API, uh, sort of going through everything except actually just invoking the function. So, yeah, as you say, that's uh, testing permissions, checking all your input parameters are correct. Yep, and that is correct. You can see, uh, you can run some remote invoke, invoke dash dash help. Uh, we should list all the options that you can use here. So like um, there's invocation type that we use, there's log type. Uh, you can send a client context, base 64 encoded okay. string. Or if you're using alias or versioning, you can use qualifier to find the alias or version that you want to invoke. And, uh, you know, just to show how the SAM config tunnel works. Um, again, let's say you don't want to, uh, you are not interested in the logs at all. You can just set log type none for all the executions and define it here, which is under default uh, remote invoke. So if you have you know syntax spaces in the uh, command definition, it should be replaced with the underscore. And you say parameters. Uh, this is of course in Tamil format. I can give one of the parameters here. So if I just run some remote invoke uh, that with JSON, uh, since I provided log type none as the default, you can see none of the logs are. Yeah, you know, none of the logs are returned in the terminal here. Um, so this was the uh, the first example application that I had. The other one is the multi-stack app. So for this one, uh, different from the previous one, uh, this is one function again in my root application, but I have another nested application under you know child stack and template YAML. If I check that uh, child stack here. This is also uh, just one function. Again, just to showcase how this will work with the nested stacks. Uh, so let's say you have this, uh, you know, uh, the setup here. You have your root template and one child template. And what we can do here now is that if I run some remote info, this won't work anymore because now I need to provide a logical ID because now I have more than one function yeah. in my, you know, in my whole application. So I can again do some remote info with child the world function. This will invoke the the function in my uh, in my root stack, but if I want to invoke the function in my child stack, I can do some remote invoke in my child stack, and then my uh, my function in my child stack is called hello Mars function. If I run this one, this will invoke the other function and return back to uh, return the result back to me. So. If you have, you know, multiple nested stacks, you know, uh, you can still use remote remote. You just need to provide the uh, the stack name and then forward slash with your uh, with your function. If you have more than one, uh, let's say you have another you know, nested stack under this child stack, you can do some remote involve you know, child stack, and then let's say and child stack forward slash your function name, and then we will find that you know function for you and invoke it. Um, the last part that I want to show is the uh, the Lambda streaming. So Lambda streaming is uh, uh, let me open my sample file. So Lambda streaming is uh, I think it's working with function URLs, right? If yeah. I'm mistaken. So you can set your invoke mode response stream. So what this will do is that as soon as you uh, send something from your Lambda function, that is directed back to the caller right away. So you don't need to wait entire thing to be completed. And if you're streaming, let's say a large file or something like that, you can just send the the chunks of that result as soon as they are available. And that will be available at the client as well. So we, with the same remote invoke, we detect this and then print the results into your terminal as they become available. So to show how this works, so this is, you know, um, Node.js example with the streaming response. So as you can see here, I'm just writing some HTML code, and then I'm just waiting for, you know, 
just a dummy one second wait, print something else, one second wait, so and so forth. So if I go to this application here, it's, I can just now run Sam remote inbox. And then now we should see the results are coming as they're available. So this is really cool. Uh, you know, if you want to test the streaming uh, response from your function, you can use the remote inbox here. And, and you, full marks, that's the first Rickroll we've had on serverless office hours, I think, if you're, if you're reading carefully. So good job, Mehmet. We've had, ours, we've had our first streaming Rickroll. So never going to give you up, never going to let you down, never going to run around and desert you. Love it. That was yeah. hidden. The, the Easter egg in serverless office hours, the, the stream that keeps on giving. <laughs> yeah. And of course, this is only available with the normal mode, because if you want to use with the output JSON mode, this is, you know, yeah. Uh, this is not applicable because your output we need your full output to be you know available so that we can return as a JSON. Format it, yeah. yeah, if I do some remote invoke dash dash output JSON. Now this will wait entire execution to be completed. And once it's completed, we will return the result. Uh, this will be different from the regular function. Um, so like in the regular function, I have just one payload and that's wow. my function result. But with the streaming you see there's an event stream. Uh, of course, this is iterable, shown as array here. So each um, object that I have, there's a payload chunk, and each chunk has the payload. So this is actually how we get from this response, and we can return it back to you know user. They need to just see these payload chunks uh, and then use it in another tool. That is actually super useful because I, I did the, the blog post on, um, on response streaming. And one of the sort of kind of issues in, in testing response streaming is, yeah, sure, you can run a website and you can you know, do HTML and via an API gateway or function URL. <clears throat> but often on the command line, to actually see the individual chunks that are coming in, you know, it takes a bit of work to try and uh, wrangle that all around and display that. This is super easy to be able to, to view that. And obviously, it's going to work with JSON. If you're using binary data, not going to be so happy. But yeah, this is. One of, one of the things uh, I was actually working on was I had an issue where I couldn't understand whether the, the, what the chunks were being delivered and if they were being buffered somewhere else and you know what the individual chunks were. So yeah, this would be really great to be able to view, uh, view, what, view what's coming in. Uh, yeah, and if, if you aren't aware, response streaming is Lambda being able to stream responses back through the Lambda API and directly to your client. So as Mehmet was showing over there, each second that, uh, that uh, result is coming in. So Lambda functions can run for up to 15 minutes and you can stream responses for all of that. So loads of use cases. Uh, I mean, obviously this is a bit of a fun example of just uh, pausing for a minute, but if you had a you know, progressive web page that you wanted to display um, uh, as things were being built on the back end, that'd be great. Or you were you know, streaming a huge bunch of JSON that you wanted to update flight times or you know GPS locations or whatever, instead of waiting for a huge chunk of JSON uh, to come and, and buffing that all and then sending it to the to the front end, uh, you can do that, you, you can do that uh, straight away. Or even streaming from S3, that's one of the really cool use cases is as you read things from S3, you can just stream it directly from Lambda. Say if you've got big, uh, big files, you know, send, send it onto your clients and you can you know, see the data appear really quickly. So yeah, Lambda response streaming is super useful and helpful for some use cases. Yeah. And in uh, fact, a correction I made, sorry to jump in again, I did say it's only using function, well, I, I think I said it's using function URLs. It's not only using function URLs. Um, function URLs makes uh, response streaming really useful, but you can actually use the SDK and just use the SDK, then use the Lambda uh, API directly. So yeah, just a bit of a caveat. It's not only, you don't have to use uh, function URLs to use Lambda stream. So. Oh, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> um, we we are checking the response stream option. I think you still need to set the invoke yeah. response stream, right? Yeah, because yeah. this is basically the flag that when the response hits, uh, well, comes back through the Lambda front end, uh, the response stream um, field is what tells uh, Lambda to send it directly rather than buffer it. So yeah, For whichever mode you need to do that, the, the response stream is the uh, is the invoke mode that works. Yeah, that's true. And I'm checking my notes. I think that was all that I want to demo today. So okay. Um, some other things when I was just reading out of it, uh, sort of under the hood, I know there was some, um, I think there were, <clears throat> under the hood, is this actually using the AWS CLI or is it using something else? Or you know, are you just sort of wrapping the CLI commands or you know, is there anything you can tell us under the hoods that's anything that's clever about this? Sure. Um, so we are, we are written in Python. So Sam Sell is written in Python. 
our SDK tooling in Python is the Boda Tree Library. Uh, it's basically the wrapper of all the API calls that we are making. Uh, so under the hood, what we are doing is that uh, I think we are making three API calls. One of them is getting your function configuration. And that is needed to decide whether you know we need a response streaming or not, because yeah. everything changes depending on this one. Once we get, you know, if we need to use response streaming or the regular invocation, then there are two methods here. One of them is the uh, the invoke method. You can also use with the AWS CLI today. So you can just use AWS Lambda and then invoke. We are using that under the hood. The other one is invoke with uh, I think response stream there. So you can use that to, so we are using that with the response streaming option, which returns the streams as soon as they're available. So we can stream it back to the terminal. So with using the SDK, that, that's how you can you sort of get the raw responses returned from the, because it's actually using the bottom three SDK to get that raw, resp uh, raw response. So when you're doing the output JSON, that's actually what's getting the raw response, uh, which, which the CLI wouldn't be able to, uh, which the CLI wouldn't be able to get as rich information. Yeah, so like I can oh, cool. the, the bottom tree uh, here. So like in the regular invocation, we are using the invoke here. Um, so as we told, like function name and the uh, the payload, make it a little bit bigger. So function name and the payload is being filled by us. Uh, of course, function name is uh, the logical ID or the physical ID that's provided. The payload again, either event or event file. And the rest of them can be uh, provided with the parameters option. And if I scroll down here, so this is the response stack uh, syntax. Uh, so payload is returned as a streaming body. Of course, we return this as a string and then you know return it back to terminal. If you use the output JSON option, the, the whole thing, the raw uh, result will be printed in the terminal. And if you're using the streaming, then instead of invoke, we we are using invoke with response stream. So this is pretty much the same. The input options are uh, the same, I guess. Um, and But the output now has a different syntax. So as you can see here, that returns an event stream, which is basically uh, the stream that we are getting from the function execution and print it back to terminal. Um, again, if you just use the default mode, we will listen all the events here. And as they become available, we will print to terminal. If not, then we will wait for the entire stream to be completed, uh, wrap it into JSON, and then return back to terminal. Okay. So, so Mehmet, how, how do you think of your, if somebody's sort of maybe scratching their head and going, how does SAM local invoke, remote invoke, SAM sync, SAM accelerate, what's a sort of simple way to wrap these all together in a development workflow? How would you suggest people approach this and using these different tools um, without getting a bit overwhelmed slash confused slash head scratching which where one should start um so i would say like we we do recommend cloud testing but local texting local testing is still like uh you know might be important especially if you want to do debugging so like you you can do um, step by step debugging with the uh, with the local if you have the uh, sam cli installed on your machine and if you're using um, JetBrains or vs code as an ide you can use uh, the AWS Toolkits extension that will, you know, debug your function. So, if you, of course, have, you know, uh, more complex uh, function code here, you can put a, you know, debugging point, and then start your function in the debug mode. That will spin up the SAM local command in the background, and you can debug your function. Again, SAM local still use Poodle for, you know, quickly checking some of the stuff before you go to the next step. But now, if you feel confident and you can just go the next step and then test your integrations with the other services. And then I think the best approach is the same thing now because uh, with the local, your permissions are not you know emulated one-to-one -one. and we only support the API gateway and invoking your function directly, support emulating API gateway and support emulating as a Lambda service. Yeah. But if you have, you know, other integrations, you we, what we recommend is to use SAM Sync. Now, with the SAM Sync, uh, the first time you run, we will first deploy your template, and once it's deployed, every code change you make, it's either function that could be layer as well, or step functions, API gateway definitions. We will sync them directly with API calls, so you don't need to wait for the CFN deployment. You can make a change. 
the change will be applied really quickly, then you can go back to you know your terminal or your you know uh, browser to console page and then test your changes right away. You will see you know you will be testing with the actual permissions that you're planning to use. Of course, that will give you know more accurate results on your testing that it will work uh, when you deploy your uh, stack once you've done your development. Okay, so oh, so that's good to know. So starting with you know building building your application with infrastructure as code is always a good idea you know you can stay in your vs code or your jet brains or, or, or that kind of thing you can use uh, sam local invoked for your local debugging uh, because that's yeah that's really powerful you know as with as with all debugging stick that little um uh, circle in your debugger and do a watch. You can look at your environment variables and all, all, all that kind of thing. I know there is some config you've got to set up in VS Code, for example, to um, create that. Um, oh, there's a debugging file. My <clears throat> told you my mind's going blank today. <clears throat> but yeah, you've got to set that up, but that's a one off and do your local debugging and then literally start your Samsync. And then as you've been showing, your Samsync just sits in the background. You don't think about it. You're not running Samsync for every. You know, every time you're going to say that's automatically just going to build your function in the background and do it. Um, I mean, it's also going to do clever building that it's only going to build the things it needs to do. So, for example, it's not, it's not going to do a whole CloudFormation uh, deploy if you update a layer, for example, or if you don't update the layer and you update the function. You know, it's going to be really as quick as it can. Uh, to be honest, I think your mileage is going to uh, vary if you've got a lot of dependencies and a lot in your build process. Yeah, it's going to take a few seconds to do that building, but you know, if you're using specifically Node and Python, you know that's going to be uh, that's going to be really uh, really good. And then yeah, every time you hit save, uh, that function is going to save into the cloud, and then you're in you know in the capable hands of Sam Remote Invoke, which I think is just a, a clever, easier way than rather than wrangling all the options of the AWS CLI. And then you're testing in the cloud, but you know it, it's as quick as local development, I, I think. You know, uh, so this is good. I want to. I, li I, li I like how we're getting better and better at doing the local experience, but making it sort of uh, making it in the cloud. Because a lot of people I talk to are still very, uh, still sort of very wedded to their local development. Uh, but I think seeing this kind of approach can really inspire people to go. You know, it's literally going to be nearly as fast uh, as doing everything locally, but you've got the power of the cloud to do it. Yeah, and like uh, as you mentioned, we are make, trying to make this as fast as possible. And if you are using, you know, one of the runtimes that you can have, uh, you know, your function code plus your dependencies. Uh, of course, that's not applicable for if you're using Golang or Rust because in yeah. the end you had, you just that's have still executable. But let's say you are using Node.js and you have a bunch of dependencies and your dependencies cost like uh, five, ten megabytes, but your actual code is like a couple of kilobytes there. What Samsung is doing background is that we create a dependency layer. And then move all that dependencies into a layer. So when you make a code change, we are not syncing that five megabytes of you know you know your function. Instead, we just sync a couple of kilobytes there, which is uh, way more faster. So we have these small you know uh, improvements in inside the Samsung command as well. Yeah, lovely. No, thanks for mentioning that. I had uh, I had forgotten that sort of dynamic layer creation for your uh, for your dependencies. Okay. What sort of other tips and tricks would you have, even for you know broader SAM SAM usage, uh, or even tying an app composer, or you know connecting with other tools? You know, we've, we've mentioned briefly a bit about CDK and Terraform. You know, <clears throat> anything in just general. We do have a few minutes left, so you know, any anything useful nuggets or tips and tricks that people can take the most out of, get the most out of their serverless development. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I briefly mentioned there, like we introduced the uh, the SAM list comment. Um, if you know people haven't used that, I highly recommend. It gives you uh, a couple of uh, you know inf it gives you information from your deployed stuff. So if I just do some remove dash dash help, sorry, some list uh, dash dash help. So there are a couple of options like uh, people can use uh, get the endpoints like if they have any um, API gateway endpoints yeah. that will be visit uh, that will be shown. Uh, they can list the resources and they can also list their stack output. So um, that was, you know, one of the uh, requests that you know customers had. Once the deployment is done, how do I get the stack outputs really quickly and then pipe it to another comment? So they can use these options to get information from their stack. And, and just in general, if they have any questions about, you know, any comments in SAM, they can just run SAM docs and then give the command lane, let's say list here. And if I enter this one, this will open a, um, uh, a browser page on my default browser, and that will take them to our documentation page. 
and then read the details of the documentation there. Um, what else? Um, so we briefly talk about the traces, but there's also some logs comment. So let's say you are syncing your function and uh, you want to see the logs or you want to see the logs for your entire stack. Like you might have step functions, API gateways. You can yeah. just run some logs and you need to provide the stack name. The stack name is already defined. So I can just run some logs. That will pull all the logs um, from my uh, resources. Well, of course, the, the supported resources. and return it back to me. Uh, of course, I didn't invoke anything recently, so this doesn't this didn't return anything. But if I try here, I should see some logs out. So like now you have the sync remote invoke, and then you can you know uh, pipe it to logs or traces, and then get more information uh, you know about your application there. And you can yeah, and you can also run the SAM logs. Um, uh, with another parameter, which also does basically a tail as well, Sam logs tail that is in another window. So you could do Sam sync in one window, your Sam tail in another window, and you'll sort of invoke uh, in your and you invoke in the middle, and there you can literally just uh, as soon as your functions are being invoked with your test, you can just see the logs. Yeah, exactly. Um, so like you can have this multiple terminal output. One you can run the Sam sync, the other one you can run the logs and tail, and then maybe use the third one as the sending the remote invoke. And then you can just watch the uh, the logs output there. Not just from your function. If your function calls another, uh, you know, yeah. function in your stack, uh, some logs will return that back to you as well. Yeah, that and that's super useful because obviously you've got the, as you were showing, even the restreaming response from your function. But if your function is then calling some other function or or even API gateway, to have all those logs in one place is yeah is invaluable. Because otherwise, you are sure it's actually easy enough to get the um, the CloudFormation logs for a Lambda function, but then you know as soon as you start need, uh, having to pull the logs from API Gateway as well, you know it just becomes a it just becomes a bit of a hassle. Never mind looking up the physical IDs to even get find out what it is, where you need to look for the logs, let alone just get, getting the logs. Yeah, exactly. Like you need to find physical ID and CloudWatch Logger to pull all that information, and Sam Logs does that for you. You it finds the 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 log group name. And then pulls that pulled all the log events. You know, let's say I said 20 minutes ago, so it goes and finds the CloudWatch log group, pull all the log events in the last 20 minutes, and you know, return it back to my terminal. Wow, oh, excellent! Actually, we do have a question who's come from uh, Liv and Matthew. Thanks for joining us via YouTube. Is there a CDK sync like Sam Sync? Um, there is one. Uh, maybe you remember. Yeah, it's not called. It's called um, CDK well, Synth, not not uh, not Sam Sync. So uh, let me just bring that up, uh, and I can post the link. CDK Synth. Yeah, CDK, and it's basically synthesizing a CDK. Um, I think I'm doing the right thing. Is that the right? I'll post it in the comments. I think yeah. So CDK does have a. That's just from a workshop, but um. There is a there is a there is an equivalent. It doesn't have quite. I don't think it has quite all of the functionality, um, but um, um, can do that kind of thing. Yeah. There we go. So that is yeah. I did post that. Yeah. Um, anything else, Mehmet? Um, anything else in the back of your mind that you hope people would know and love? Um, let me talk about the uh, the remote testing stuff. Um, similar to CDK, if you have a CDK project or Terraform project, we do support you know locally testing uh, those applications. Uh, so Sam can uh, you know parse that information from CDK. I think you need to run Synth first, and of course uh, you also can use the Sam, some of the Sam local commands with the Terraform applications. So we are bringing that features you know our local features to other IAC frameworks uh, that people are using. Uh, so if they never try, we highly recommend using the uh, the CDK or the Terraform customers. Terraform is still in beta, and we should have some RFC open in the, uh, of course, I just forgot to mention, we are open source, we are in GitHub. So if you have any requests, uh, feature requests or bug reports, don't hesitate to you know, create an issue in our repository, then uh, we can take a look at it. Terraform is still in beta. If you have any, you know, feedbacks there, uh, we highly, you know, appreciate your feedbacks so that we can address them before we announce the feature as created. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was a whole other <clears throat> thing to yeah mention as you did. You know, all of Sam is open source. <clears throat> you know, available on GitHub. You can have a look. 
Uh, even Sam Init has got a whole bunch of functionality for just creating scaffolding for a project. And there are more and more sample applications literally added all the time. Um, so yeah, take a look at that. Um, if, if you're unaware of the Lambda Power Tools, AWS Power Tools, uh, which is a set of libraries for just helping with observability and a whole, and particularly for Python, a whole lot of different tools, they've uploaded, they've updated their SAM templates initially. So if you want to just a, a start a project that has an API with a Lambda function behind it, with all the Power Tools, example code and everything, you just deploy that uh, straight away from SAM in it, and yeah, and you're off and you're going. So yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm. Even working at AWS, I'm super impressed with the SAM team, how it's been continually iterating over the past, well, quite a few years, and just more and more functionality, you know, with I think this big focus on uh, on the testing piece of it uh, has been really useful. So yeah, we, we appreciate all the hard work that uh, that uh, Mehmet and the rest of the team uh, do for SAM. And yeah, thank you so much for, you know, uh, inviting me to this live stream. Uh, by the way, for the remote team work, we do support Lambda for now. Uh, but we are planning to support for other resources. Uh, like in the uh, next iterations, you should be able to use with the step functions and some other resources. Wow. Again, for remote remote, we have an RFC open in the, uh, the SAM CLI report. If you have any suggestions or feedback, uh, you know, we highly appreciate your, uh, your comments there. Ah, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Just before we say goodbye uh, to Mehmet, just talking about next week. Well, next week we enter DynamoDB land with Jason Hunter, and he's a really good, knowledgeable person for DynamoDB. And he's going to be talking all about global tables, all the cool things you can do with it, all the things you need to think about. The, you know, if you've got questions and caveats and uh, awesome kind of things, Jason Hunter, same time, uh, same uh, place next week for DynamoDB Global Tables. Uh, wrong screen. <clears throat> then also, we have mentioned serverlessland.com, all the information you need about serverless on AWS, the landing page for blogs, the new learning page, code, and all those kind of things. There's the good new learning page, which is super useful. Don't forget EDA Day in Nashville, 26th of October. We'd love to be able to see you there. And actually super relevant for today is the serverless patterns collection and workflows and snippets and repos. And this is literally just code ready to go. I don't even know how many patterns there are. I think they're well over four or 500 by now. I I was helping people add, I think four or five yesterday. So yeah, a super good resource, great crack categorization. You can, uh, you can filter by SAM or CDK or Terraform or Pulumi. Just literally so many resources to be able to connect different services together. Because um, yeah, hunting around all over the interwebs to try and work out how you're going to get different services connecting together. This is an amazing resource, and again, all open source. So if if you have your own cool stuff, that is super useful to contribute. Workflows is all about step functions, so lots of example applications for step functions. Snippets are cool little codes or CLI commands, and repos are just uh, really cool resources all across the internet of uh, whole repositories to learn about different aspects of serverless. So yeah, super useful stuff to be able to. Um, find out what's going on in the world of serverless. But Mehmet, thanks really much for your time today. I'm sure we'll have you on uh, in the future, but we appreciate you putting a cool demo together. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Okay. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Same time, same place next week.